Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, if you are just joining us, um, thank you so much for joining today's fundraising webinar. Um, my name is Molly Fast, and I have had the pleasure of working on this project uh, since 2002. Um, the photo that you see in front of you right now is a picture of me and my mother. Um, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in January of 1999, and that is the reason why I got started in this line of work. Um, I ended up um, watching my sister, my oldest sister, Kara, had participated in the first New York three-day. She learned about it um, while she was in the hospital waiting room while my mom was going through treatment for uh, her first operation for breast cancer. So my sister did all of the fundraising and the training while my mom was going through chemo and radiation. And as a family, we went down and saw my sister finish in Central Park back in August of 1999, and I was hooked from the first moment that I had experienced the three-day. So in 2000, I was living in San Francisco for the summer and decided to volunteer for the three-day and loved it. And in 2001, I decided to participate. It was my first experience doing any sort of fundraising. Um, I would use the term training very loosely. I was not very good about my training, um, but that was my first real experience participating in the three-day. And from that experience, I decided that I wanted to try to work for the company. So I've been really fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, since January of 2002, I've seen um, the three-day uh, through a lot of changes and a lot of iterations, but it's always been something that has been such a pleasure for me to be able to work on. Um, and over my years, I have certainly experienced various loss uh, with um, people in my life due to breast cancer, but also just a lot of um, opportunity to create change and really be impacted by this event. So um, I feel such a privilege to be able to work on this event and to be able to talk to you today about fundraising. Um, I'm also doing this webinar with Liz Parks, who is our coach for the Dallas-Fort Worth market. And Liz, I'd love to be able to have you go off of mute for a second and just talk a little bit about your history with the three-day as well. Perfect. Hi, my name is Liz. I'm your coach for the Dallas-Fort Worth three-day. I have been a participant in the three-day since 2004. I did my first walk um, to honor my aunt, who was a two-time survivor. And like Molly says, I was hooked. I met a young girl mm -hmm. um, in 2004 who had just lost her mother. And I couldn't imagine a young girl at 19 years old going through life, not having her mom there um, for college and merit, weddings and babies and things and it just it devastated me so I came back for my second year. I've now walked seven times. I've been a crew member 11 times. Um, I raised over $27,000 so I do know a little bit about fundraising as well as training. I'm also a training walk leader um, because even though the years I crew I also get out there and train. Um, it's part of the camaraderie. It's such an amazing event, and I'm really looking forward to connecting with all of you and helping you fulfill your dreams and make it to your first your three-day journey. Thank you, Liz. Okay. So um, there are three things that to get started with today's webinar that I want to share with you. Um, one is that we want to help you succeed. Obviously, what we're here to do on this end of the three days to make sure that you have all of the tools and knowledge that you need to successfully prepare for the three day with both your training and your fundraising. And obviously today's webinar is all about giving you some practical fundraising advice um, from you know, both Liz and myself to people who have walked the walk. Um, literally walked the walk, and also we have been part of other fundraisers outside of the three days, a way to expand our own knowledge and experience so that we can take some of those learnings back and teach them to, to you as well. Um, the second thing is your coach is the best fundraising resource that you have. So every single coach who we have who works on the three-day has been a participant. Um, Liz has one of the most impressive um, participation histories among our three-day coaching staff, but she is not alone in that dedication and in her years of service as a participant w within the three-day. So 
whether this is your first time doing it or whether it's your 10th time doing it or whether you started this event you know, way back when and you're returning to the event now, your coach is an incredible resource who is there to help you with your fundraising and your training um, to make sure that you're successful. Not only do we all have the benefit of our own personal fundraising experience because we all have done the three-day or are currently doing the three-day still, but we have the added benefit of speaking with thousands and thousands of participants who have tried pretty much everything. I always tell people that your fundraising, what you do for fundraising is only limited by your creativity um, and sometimes with the law. We know that there are some things that you can't do. Um, so your coach is a great resource. So you know, we sometimes get to the end of the year and we ask a question in the survey of, you know, how helpful did you find your coach? And we inevitably have some people who say, I didn't even know I had a coach. Um, so you do, you have a coach, and your coach is an amazing resource to help make sure that you're successful. So reach out and connect with your coach if you haven't done that yet, and just know that there is so much knowledge and information um, waiting for you from your coach. Um, and the third thing is that you absolutely can raise $2,300. I will be talking a little bit about some things that I have done myself. Um, with my own fundraising experience, but I guarantee you that if you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and to try some new things, you can absolutely reach your fundraising minimum if you implement some of the fundraising advice that we'll be sharing with you. Um, it doesn't matter how much time you have. I'll be talking a little bit more about this, but my sister who I've been helping, um, she's one of those people who, as I said, she did the event back in 1999, and she's doing it now 17 years later. Her reasons for doing them um, then versus now are very different, um, but she raised her fundraising minimum within three days. So I take a lot of this advice, and I use my own friends and family as little guinea pigs to help, you know, help them along with their fundraising, and I can tell you that it does work. So um, we're here to make sure that, that whether you have a week or a month or three months to do this, you can absolutely make it happen. So a little bit about my own participation and my own fundraising history that I wanted to share with you so you have a little bit of knowledge of my own experience with fundraising, but also, like I said, that I've walked the walk, not just the three-day, but in other events. Um, the picture on the left is from my very first three-day. It is taken a million years ago, but more precisely in 2002. So it was taken 14, no, 2001. So it was taken in 2001, so it was taken almost 15 years ago. Almost 15 years ago, exactly, I'm realizing as I'm saying this, um, with my best friend Amy. It was my first time walking the three-day. As I said, I definitely found the fundraising to be a lot easier than the training for me. I did not have as much discipline with the training, which is where I learned very firsthand that how much you train beforehand determines how much you hurt after the event. Um, but it was my first time fundraising and learning how to share a personal story, how to put that together, how to be comfortable asking people for donations, and also getting that amazing uh, I don't want to say hi, but that just that insane feeling that you get knowing that the people around you are the ones who are supporting you to make something possible. Um, it was great, and then I participated in the three-day again in 2002 uh, with my twin sister, so just a year later, and I participated in the three-day again in 2009 as a crew member in Denver, um, where I raised over $5,000 to be the top crew fundraiser for that event, which was a wonderful experience. Um, on the upper right-hand corner is a picture of me from earlier this year, and that sign that I'm holding up is a list of all of my donors. <laughs> you can see that there are a lot of names. There's not a lot of blank space on that piece of paper. Um, but four years ago, I started doing an event called Cycle for Survival, Again, I did it as a little bit of a fundraising experiment just to see what it would be like to fundraise for a different event because I had only fundraised for um, breast cancer up until that point. Um, but rare cancers is something that is important to me as well. My father passed away at the age of 55 uh, from esophageal cancer. And so doing something to give back in that capacity, since most of my focus had been on breast cancer, was something that was important to me. Um, and then the photo in the bottom right-hand uh, corner is a picture of my sister on the left, her daughter, in sandwich in between me and my mother. And I shared this picture because it's also from this year's Washington, D.C. Race for the Cure. 
And um, my mom and my sister decided to start fundraising on the Monday before the event. So they had six days to fundraise before they showed up on event. Um, my sister, Megan, raised over $3,000 in about three days, and my mom ended up raising over $5,000 in about five days. Um, my mom was the number 10 top fundraiser on that event. Um, she, out of, there's about 11,000 plus participants for that event, and my sister ended up being, I think, one of the top, five, uh, five, top 50 participants for that event. So I really, like I said, try to take what I've learned and help the people around me. And, you know, when we took a look at some of the needs and the tools for the three-day, this was something that I was really passionate about that I wanted to share with all of you. Um, and my hope is that you like what you hear, you're able to implement some of the suggestions that I have, um, and that you can then, if you're a team captain or if you're on a team, share this information with them. But there is also another fundraising webinar taking place on Monday, July 25th. So hopefully you can get some more of your friends to join this. Um, my fundraising history has been really, I, I've done literally crazy things like this year I set a goal to try to raise $13,000 in 15 days for my participation in Cycle for Survival. And I actually ended up raising, I wrote this down just before I got on, um, I ended up raising $16,711 in about 17 days. Um, I did this with the help of uh, 213 donors. Um, and to put this into perspective, because I think it's really important that you hear this. My average donation size was $75. I don't happen to know people who can write a $500,000 check or higher than that. And I know there are some people who do have people in their life who are able to make sizable donations, but that was not, that's not me. I, my thing is I need to ask a lot of people. Um, the year before that, I decided to try to raise $10,000 in 10 days. Um, I waited until that much time out from the event before I started my fundraising. It's different, obviously, with an event like the three-day where there are travel, um, many people travel to do the event, and you want to make sure you have that taken care of. Um, but that has kind of been my thing, is just experimenting with how much money I can raise in as short of a period of time or how that impacts how I ask people, how I follow up with them, and what that looks like. So my fundraising tactics have been you know, pretty radical, and I don't necessarily say, like, I expect you guys to all try to raise $17,000 in 15 days or anything like that. But the concept of you know, asking everyone you know, of really expanding your donor base, of asking you know, for a specific amount, um, you know, all of those are things that we'll touch on. So we're going to go ahead and get started with fundraising advice that works. And again, I'm, I'm using some of what I've learned and what I've shared with you know, my friends and family to help them with their fundraising. And I want to start with two reminders. I just had to share these with my sister who was apprehensive about asking people for money. Um, the first is that no one is going to give away their last dollar. And I think for those of us who are nervous about asking people for money or who think about fundraising in those terms of I hate asking people for money, remember that no one is going to give away their last dollar. If someone wants to support you, they will, and they'll do it because they have the money to be able to do that. Um, and secondly, no one is going to donate more than they're comfortable giving. So regardless of how much money you may ask for, um, and that is something that I'll be talking about is asking for a specific amount, regardless of how much you ask for, someone is going to give you what they are most comfortable giving. Sometimes that may mean that they give you not what you ask for. Sometimes it means that they give you more than you ask for. Um, but no one's going to give more than they're comfortable giving. So even if you ask for that specific amount and you're apprehensive about that, remember that people are going to give what they can and what they are comfortable giving. So setting yourself up for fundraising success. There are five things that I want to share with you guys um, in this area. One is share your personal story. I, I know from having done this um, for many years now at this point that some people keep their story close to them. They don't feel comfortable talking about it. And this is an area in which you need to be willing to stretch yourself a little bit because um, your personal story is really what sets you apart from all of the other ways that people get asked for money. Um, and it's also really compelling. You know, my reason for doing 
the three day when I participated was for my mother who had been, you know, recently diagnosed with cancer. And a lot of people didn't know how to help and this was a way in which they could do that. Um, my reasons, as I said, they, it's changed over the years and that's also allowed me to keep my donors along for this journey, especially for those of you who have been doing the event over and over again. I know that there are different reasons that are introduced into why you have done this event, why you continue to do it. We have the pleasure of meeting some really incredible people through our participation in this event. But sharing your personal story is really important for you in being successful with your fundraising. Um, Asking for a specific and meaningful amount. Um, as, as I said, making sure that you ask for what you want. Um, I, I know for some people they are most comfortable leaving it open-ended, but again, if we're going back to what do you need to do to be successful, you need to ask people for a specific amount. When I say meaningful, and I, I talk about this when you decide on what your fundraising goal is as well, what I mean is, um, Say, for example, you lost your grandmother when she was um, 67 years old, and maybe that is a meaningful amount for you to ask as your base for how much you would like for people to consider donating to your fundraising request. Um, I'm going to share a little bit later about you know, one of the ways in which I helped my sister, but this was one of the ways in terms of helping her come up with a specific and meaningful amount as well. Creating a short deadline. Um, now, for if, if some of you are on this calling, you're participating in the Michigan event, this is already built into what you're doing right now because we're about, I think, two and a half, three weeks away from um, the first event of the season, which is Michigan. But for those of you who may be doing some of our later markets, one of the challenges that you face is that there's so much time between now and when you have to show up on events. We hear it you know, over and over again from our participants that there is a there's like a lack of urgency from your donors because there's so much time until the event and this is something that you have the ability to manipulate and to really change for yourself creating a shorter deadline is absolutely what's helped me be most successful with my fundraisers um, specific to my participation in cycle for survival as I said I you know said that I was trying to raise $10,000 in 10 days or $13,000 in 15 days. Um, by setting that short deadline, it prevents people from being able to procrastinate and it also gives you the time to be able to follow up with people in a shorter time frame. So I would encourage all of you to consider setting a shorter deadline for yourself. And as you communicate with donors and potential donors, it's very easy to be able to say something like, um, I'm participating in the San Diego three-day, although the event isn't until November, I've set a goal for myself to hit my fundraising goal by July 31st. Will you please consider making a $67 donation today to help ensure that I meet my goal by the end of the month so I can focus entirely on my training? Um, so there's language that you can use absolutely to, to help get you there for that short deadline. Um, and then set a challenging and meaningful goal. Um, as I said, you know, I in the past couple years have sort of fooled around with today. Uh, this year I decided to do $13,000 in 15 days because I realized that at the end of that, um, that year that I will have raised $40,000 for this organization in the past four years if I was able to raise $13,000. Um, so that's how I set that goal. It was definitely challenging. <laughs> and, um, but what I found was that my donors were really engaged in my goal. They, they understood why I had set that goal and they were willing to meet me there based on the donations that I got from people um, because I set it so high. And I think you know, sometimes we set the goal at what the, go what the fundraising minimum is for this event, right? Like $2,300 is my goal. But, you know, the second you kind of expand your sites a little bit beyond that, I really believe that you'll be pleasantly surprised that the people in your life are going to help you want to get there and they're going to respond a little differently based on your goal, not on your fundraising minimum. And the last thing is that you need to be willing to work for your goal, especially if you set, you know, a, a crazy goal like I have, right? I mean, I, um, I can't tell you how uncomfortable I got, um, but I was willing to get uncomfortable because the goal was really important to me. The cause was really important to me. 
and as I said, we have the pleasure of being surrounded by so many passionate people who are completely motivated and inspired by so many reasons to participate in the three-day. Um, but you have to be willing to work for your goal. And for me, that meant stepping outside of my comfort zone, one, just by how I set the goal, but how many people I reached out to, how I asked them for money, how much I asked them for, and how many times I was willing to follow up with them before I kind of considered my fundraising done. So it's hard work. It, that's also why I feel like creating a shorter deadline is a little more manageable because I don't think any one of us could sustain, you know, working over the course of, you know, three, four months at that pace. But if you dedicate a little bit of time every day for, you know, two, three weeks to reach your goal by doing all of these things that we're going to go into detail with, that helps kind of keep that to a confined, confined space so that you have brain power and space for other things in your life. So... Um, I want to talk a little bit about why people donate because I think, again, it, it helps us as fundraisers keep this in mind as we go about our fundraising, um, especially because it can, get, it can get hard, it can get tiring, we can you know, lose some motivation along the way. But you know, people donate to you because they love you, right? This is something that people can do to show their support for something um, you know, that is, is really important to you and it's a way for them to show that they love you, period, the end. It's one of the things that I really love the most about this kind of fundraising. We call it peer-to-peer -peer fundraising since you are asking another person to support your fundraising efforts. Um, it's a great way for you to, to learn you know, just how much people care about you. Obviously, it's not the only way, but it's a really meaningful way to see people come together for something that means a lot to you. Um, <laughs> this was something I was reminded of, and I'm sure many of you, especially if you've done this event over and over again, um, is that people donate to you because you're doing something that most people in our lives have no interest in doing themselves. Um, walking 60 miles is really, really hard. Um, the amount of time that you put into training for doing this, um, not to mention the actual walk, the first time I did the three-day, I had six blisters. I, and, you know, obviously, I didn't train as well as I, I, as I could have, but I ended up having three blisters on each foot. And it was hard, and, you know, I was motivated by a lot of things. You know, most, uh, you know, top of the list for, for me was my mom. But I was reminded through conversations with my donors that they had no desire to walk 60 miles, and they, they thought that I was kind of crazy for doing it, especially since, when I had done it for the first time, it was back in 2001 when the event was still fairly new. Um, but you're doing something that a lot of people don't want to do, so, and you're giving them an opportunity to support you. Um, and, you know, another reason that people donate is obviously because they've been personally uh, impacted by the cause and they want to do something. So your participation in the three-day provides them with an opportunity to not only show their support to you, but to be able to do something when someone they love or when themselves have a breast cancer diagnosis. And we, I think all of us probably on this call have been in that position ourselves um, where you, there's not much that you can do to, for someone who is going, specifically going through a breast cancer diagnosis. I think um, our participation in the three-day is such a meaningful way to support and love and honor someone um, and a very meaningful way to remember someone and to be able to provide other people with an opportunity to come along for that ride and to give them an opportunity to do something is one of the reasons why people donate. Um, but the last thing is people also donate because you ask. This is not my first fundraising webinar, um, and in a lot of the materials that we share with three-day participants, we talk about the golden rule of fundraising, which is that you have to ask. <laughs> um, I think we talk about like you don't get money when you don't ask for it, and you get money when you do ask for it. And um, so making sure that asking people for uh, donations is a big part of why you get them. And when I say ask, I really mean this one-to-one -one ask. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this, you know, a little bit later in the presentation, but we live in this world where there's so much competition with various events, but also with how people are asking for money and putting up a link on Facebook and stuff like that. And to me, putting something up on Facebook 
as a general ask with a link is not, it's not asking someone for a donation. Um, but we'll go into that in a little bit later. So, um, so I'm going to share a little bit about what's worked for me um, in a few, different, a few different topics. So the first is asking everyone. So I ask every single person I know, and I seriously mean every single person I know. I, um, I, for my participation this year, I asked 339 people if they would be willing to donate to me. I ended up having 213 donors, which is very good. Um, but again, I was really willing to step outside of my comfort zone and ask every single person that I knew that I had contact information for. Um, some people I hadn't talked to in a while, but again, I personally was very, very motivated by the goal that I had set for myself and very much wanted to, wanted to reach that. Um, this is something that I learned early on in my fundraising career and something that has been a challenge for me for sure over the years to adopt, but never make a decision for a potential donor, sometimes based on their own life circumstances or something you may know. But it's very important to make sure that you allow your donors, your potential donors, to decide what's important for them in terms of how they spend their money. Um, this year, I had two friends who I really, I've really had to kind of step outside of my comfort zone with and ask for donations. One is a very good friend of mine who started her own company, and about a week before I started um, my fundraising this year, she had canceled a, lunch, a dinner with me because she said she probably needed to be careful with her money. Um, and then I had another friend who had just gotten laid off. And both of them were previous donors. They've been donating to me for several years, and I was going to leave them off of my um, donation request for this year. But I listened to the advice that I give to every single person who I talk to about fundraising, and I decided to include them in my fundraising request. And my friend who started her own business, who had canceled dinner with me, gave me the same donation that she gave me last year. And the one who had just gotten laid off gave me about half as much. Now, I don't care about you know, how much money they gave me. I was just incredibly touched that this is what was important to them. And it was a good reminder for me to recognize that my job isn't to make decisions for my donors, but to ask and let them make the decision for themselves. So um, that's a, it's, a big, it's a big reminder that's been good for me that I hope I can pass along to all of you. Um, this one also kind of falls under the category of you need to be willing to work for it. So I ask people for a donation by sending an individual request to each person. And I send that request via email. Um, I think my grandparents are probably the only people who I sent, my grandparents and my father-in-law were the only two people who I sent an actual piece of mail to asking for their support. Um, but I don't rely on social media. I don't, um, I, may, I, I don't send one generic email out to every person. And again, it's incredibly time consuming, but it's also incredibly effective. So this is something that if you're struggling with your fundraising, um, and you're looking for different ways to engage your donors, I would challenge you to start sending individual requests so that you can personalize them instead of sending one bulk email. Or if you have been just throwing up a link on Facebook and le leaving your uh, fundraising up that way, I would encourage you to adopt a more personal and individual way to ask people to support you. Um, so what else has worked for me? Being specific. So I mentioned, I mentioned this a couple of times. I ask for a specific amount. Um, I, as I look back through my own fundraising reports that I create for myself, I have been able to see that it, you know, in most cases, people are far likelier to give me the amount that I ask for. Um, what's been great is you know, some people have given me more, and some people have given me less, but I always stretch myself a little bit to ask for at least $25 and I think that I'm most comfortable with. Um, when I first started, you know, started fundraising, I asked for a specific amount, but what I've been able to do since then is to personalize it based on um, some of my previous donors' fundraising history. So I take a look at that as well. 
Um, again, it's been helpful for me to remember that people will never give more than, than what they can because it is uncomfortable for me sometimes to ask people for a specific amount, especially if I start to let my emotions get into it and start making decisions for other people. Um, how much you ask for, so whatever that base amount is that you're asking for people to consider donating for your participation in the three-day, this is a piece of homework that I want you guys to take out of today's webinar. Um, what is that amount that's meaningful to you? Um, my sister, who's walking in the San Diego three-day this year, um, she settled on $88. Um, it represents the combined age of her two childhood friends who both died within the past year from triple negative breast cancer. Now, what's interesting is I looked uh, just before I got on the call to see um, what my sister's, uh, what her fundraising efforts were at this point. But what's interesting is she asked for $88, and the most, um, the most common donation size for her is actually $100. So she definitely has several donations that are at 88, but if she had asked for $50, she probably would have gotten a lot of $75 donations, how that tends to go. But she asked for 88, thinking that's what she'd get, but she's mostly been getting $100 donations, which has been nice. So her reason also is obviously very personal um, and very, very fresh. Her, one, of her, one of her best friends died last March, and another one died just about a month and a half ago. So it's, again, something that people are really willing to, willing and wanting to get on board to show their support um, for her losses. Um, but that's what she chose. She chose 80, she actually chose $44, full, full disclosure, and I told her she needed to go to 88. So that's how that works in my family. Um, this is from some fundraising that I did back in 2013. And so obviously this, you know, is no pop quiz. It's not hard for you to see how much money I asked people for. I used my base as $50. Um, that was before I decided to do crazy things like raise $10,000 in 10 days and $13,000 in 15 days. Um, but this was the year that I believe I ended up raising about $6,400 with uh, just over 100 donors. So my average donation size at that point was about $61. But I asked for $50. I pretty much got $50 from the majority of my donors. You can see that about 43 donors had donated at the $50 level. But again, to my point of people will give what they're comfortable giving, Half of those people gave $25. I got half of the people to give me half that amount, but another half of those people gave me more than that, gave me $100. They doubled that donation. Um, that's why it's important to, to choose a specific amount because you're giving people something that they can choose what they want, but they will most likely give you what you're asking for. Like I said, in the case of my sister, she's not getting what she asked for. She's getting more, which is certainly a nice problem to have. Um, but just a good visual for you to consider as you look at the importance of asking people for a specific amount. Um, as I talked about setting goals, um, I, I have for the past couple of years, I've set a meaningful and challenging goal. And what I've found is that my donors really get behind this. It's been really just such an honor to go through this process and it's been so meaningful for me um, to see the support that I'm getting from my donors. But I also have learned to kind of not sell myself short in recognizing that when we set these lofty goals for ourselves, we're compelled to get there, right? And, you know, as long as we're surrounding ourselves with the right people, we have people who are there who want us to reach our goals and to also help us get there. So I've found it to be just such a great experience from this of, make, of seeing that my, my donors are really invested in the goal that I set. I also, for those of you who have been doing the event for um, multiple years, I have gotten in the habit of increasing my goal from previous years. And it's been a really great conversation point as I continue to reach out to the same donors by um, giving them, a, again, a specific amount. Um, last year when I was doing my, let's see if I can raise $10,000 in 10 days, I realized that if all of my donors from 2014, there was like 135 of them, if all of them gave me about $12 more than the previous year, then 
I would be able to get to $10,000. Now, obviously, you know, I'm, none of my donations necessarily stay the same, so I don't have the same number of donors. Some donors give one year and don't the other year. But it was, a, it was a way that I could talk to participants. So what I had done was, again, I determined how much money each donor would need to give to help me get there, and then I asked each donor to give that much. Now, obviously, the donor who I'd reached out to with this example, they had given me $75 the year before. And that's, again, where the work really comes in of sending these individual asks to people. I look at how much they gave me the previous year, I figure out what their new total would be if they gave me just $12 more, and I plant that seed with them. Um, I ended up raising, I went from um, you know, raising 8500 in 2014 to raising 12000 So I definitely reached that goal, and I had my donors to thank for that, obviously for getting engaged in that goal and helping me get there. Um, I also post frequent updates on Facebook thanking my donors um, and giving them a report of where I'm at with my goal. So what that does is it really keeps my fundraising top of mind for the people who are in my life who follow me on Facebook or who I'm friends with on Facebook or have given to me and I'm friends with them on Facebook. And it's been a really great way to also pick up some new donors who, you know, Facebook, we all have a lot of acquaintances that we don't necessarily have personal email addresses for and stuff like that. And that's certainly the case for me as well. So I have ended up picking up a few donors that way. But there are people who have said like, oh, I saw your link, you know, and I wanted to make a donation. It's not like I'm not necessarily making, it, making that my main mode of asking. Um, but it's been pretty great because what I found by keeping people engaged and involved in my goal is that people have donated more than once. Um, I've had people who they see that I'm close and they want to help me get there or they see that I've increased my goal and they're really compelled to um, make that happen or they want to be the one to get me to my goal. So um, that's, been, that's been a great way for me also to set my goal and to involve um, social media in that regard. And then the last point on, um, on setting goals is I definitely recommend increasing your goal as you get closer to your current fundraising goal. I know from my own um, personal fundraising habits of when people ask me for money that if they're close or at their goal, I don't give them as much because they don't need it. They may ask me for $100, but I may see that they're only $25 away from their goal and I'll give them $26. So you never want to give someone an excuse to give you less than you're asking for. And listen, I get it. I'm currently going through this battle with my sister who set her goal, I think, to 4,400. I wanted her to set it to 8,800, and we settled on 4,400 for now. And she's now at 4,500. So she's surpassed her goal, which is very exciting for her because she met her goal. But she's not walking until San Diego, so she has a lot of time to continue her fundraising. So. I'm trying to work with her on increasing her goal, and I can appreciate how going from a 4,400 goal to an 8,800 goal is not really that desirable for her. But, you know, I know that she needs to change her goal so that people who are continuing to go to her page or to learn about her participation don't have that psychological factor that many of us have of knowing that she's already met her goal, so she doesn't really need my help. So um, people, like, at, like I said, they're likely to give less or not at all if you're close to or at your goal. So I would consider, uh, I'd ask you to consider changing your goal as you get to or at your goal if you definitely ha know that you have another fundraising push going on or if you have more follow-up that you need to do. Um, the other thing is engaging my donors. So when I send out my fundraising request, I ask people to share the names of the people in their lives who have been impacted by cancer so that I may keep those names in mind. Um, that photo that I had shared at the beginning with all of the names of my donors that was very full, I have another sign that has the names of all of the people that my donors have asked for me to participate in honor or in memory of. And I also um, keep that with me on the event weekend so that it's something that I'm drawing, I'm drawing energy from and definitely drawing motivation from. 
But what my goal with this is to make people feel included in my event weekend experience. I want them to feel connected to what I'm doing, and I don't want them to think that it's just about their financial support because I really want them to be engaged in what I'm doing and to know that it goes way beyond just writing a check or submitting a donation online. So um, I ask for that information so that I can really be keyed into why they're, why they're supporting me. Um, and then I engage my donors during the event weekend. So again, going back to Facebook, which is where I think this is the biggest benefit to social media, is I dedicate portions of my participation to the people in my life, to my donors, um, on behalf of the people who they're giving, um, who they're, what inspires their giving, um, or if it's for themselves, you know. So I may say, like, this next stretch of road is dedicated to my friends who have lost their mother or who have watched their mother fight through a breast cancer diagnosis. And then I tag all of those donors of mine who have told me that this is for their mom or for their mother-in-law or something like that. And it's something that um, when I do the cycle for survival, I ride for four hours straight. So if you didn't think I was crazy already, there's another reason. But um, to push myself physically, I ride a stationary bike for four hours. And for every hour, I dedicate that hour to various people in my life who have supported my fundraising efforts and the people that they love. So um, that's something that you can consider, again, engaging your donors beyond them just giving you a donation and sending them a thank you letter and sharing with them how your event experience went. Making it personal. So I talked a little bit about this already, but I want to touch on this again because there is so much that we're competing with, um, with uh, getting buried in someone's timeline on Facebook or Twitter or the various requests. We know that people get hit up frequently um, for donation requests. So when you're asking someone for money, they need to know why this is important to you, why they should give money to you, where the money is going, how it's going to make a difference, um, so that it compels them to make a donation. Um, my fundraising letters are likely a little too long. I just got together with a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a few years, and he said, <laughs> He said, Molly, you need to stop sending me those two-page fundraising requests. Just say, Mike, it's time. So you may be surrounded by people who don't need it, but I think we owe it to our potential donors to share with them the reasons of why this is important to us and why their support would make a difference. As I said, we live in a time you know, where people are asking for donations frequently. This, again, goes back to the don't make decisions for donors. Our concern shouldn't be how many times people are getting asked for donations. It's whether this is where the person is choosing to put their money um, and to show their support. But your personal story is the thing that makes your request stand out. And so um, making sure that you include those personal details, um, the people who you're participating in this event for, why it's important to you is really compelling. Um, as I said, I use social media as a last resort. Um, when I, um, I'm going to show you some details with the follow-up, which I think is pretty funny, but um, I usually get to a panic point the day before the event when I realize that I have this huge goal and I still have like $4,000 to go and there's no way I'm going to get there. And so what I'll do is I'll go onto my Facebook page and I will send a private message to someone and tell them, I don't have your email address. This is not the way that I typically do fundraising, but I'm participating in this fundraiser. I would love, for, I'd love your support. If it's something that you're interested in, would you mind giving me your personal email address so I can share with you why this is important to me? So again, I, I don't break my own personal rule, um, and if someone gives me their email address, then obviously they're interested. They don't always come through, but at least I am able to get their email address and, and make the request outside of Facebook Messenger. Um, it's okay to ask via Facebook and, and, and other social channels, but I wouldn't rely on it, and especially I would not rely on just putting up your link to your personal page and telling people to check it out. Um, I, as I say in here, people deserve a personal ask. Um, and again, you'll be far more successful if you're personalizing your fundraising efforts instead of leaving it up to who's paying attention and following you on social media. I think we all know how much is on there and how quickly things 
pop up and change um, on social media. So um, your best bet is to do that personal ask, and it's made very, very easy through the three-day fundraising app and also through the participant center. Um, following up, so this is another big one. So after you set your deadline, map out when you're going to be doing your follow-ups. Um, my recommendation is to plan on at, doing at least three follow-ups, and this is if you're doing, it, doing your fundraising in a short period of time, say if you're doing it over the course of a few days, a few weeks. Um, if you, you are going to still draw your fundraising out over the course of several months, you'll want to come up with a different follow-up plan. Um, but you definitely want to make sure that when you follow up with people is something that you are making a conscious decision about. Um, as I said, my recommendation is to do at least three follow-ups. Um, asking more than once may seem uncomfortable for some of you, and I know, again, in our experience of working with three-day participants, some people just don't follow up at all, um, but you're going to get most of your donations after you do follow-ups. Um, I, and I think we, we all know that from our own lives, right, like we're busy, our inboxes get completely out of control, um, we forget, and the reminder is exactly what helps people remember that they want to donate. Um, I've had a lot of people who have said things like, I'm so sorry, I meant to make a donation, thank you so much for sending me the link again, I'll take care of that tonight. Um, and again, no one's going to donate if they don't want to, but your follow-up or your follow-ups is what's going to help keep it top of mind for them. You can also give your potential donor an out. Um, for those of us who feel like we're completely badgering people if we're sending too many follow-ups, you can always tell someone if this isn't something that you're able to do, I completely understand. I'd still love for you to let me know if there are people in your life who I can who I can keep in my heart over my event weekend experience. Um, please give me their name so that I may carry them with me and think of them as I'm walking 60 miles. Um, you can also ask people to forward your email requests along. Um, you can also ask your donors to um, share that they've made a donation to you on Facebook. There are a lot of other ways that you can do follow-up. Um, and there are also ways that for people who aren't able to donate that they can still be involved. Um, and feel part of that process. So this is from an, when I did Cycle for Survival back in 2013. So this is my first year of participation um, before I decided to do my fundraising in a very short period of time. But I obviously, when I first sent out my letter on February 7th, I had, it looks like, about 21 donations within the first two days, which was great. Um, and then I sent another reminder on the 23rd. I had, at that point, more donations than I had gotten since you know, uh, February 9th. Um, I had saw another spike two days later on the 25th. I can't remember, to be honest, if I sent another um, follow-up out at that point or not. But I did a follow-up the day before the event. And if you take nothing else away from this whole webinar, please let it be that you absolutely must send out a final follow-up email, whether it's the day before your deadline, um, which I hope, again, is in a shorter period of time and, and not based on your event date. Um, I got 26 donations the day before the event by sending one more final follow-up email. So the data speaks for itself, right? Obviously, I'm a geek if I have any of this you know, figured out and on display for you guys to see. Um, but that was a really, really important lesson for me, and it also highlighted what I have been saying, which is that we tend to procrastinate, and we need reminders from people in order to stay on course. Um, and this was a really good reminder that I got for myself um, back in 2013 that's been really helpful for me especially as I feel like, uh, I think I've pushed it. I think if people wanted to donate, they would have done it already by now. So I don't want to send another follow-up. And this showed me more than anything how flawed my thinking was with that and how appreciative people were of the reminder and how much they did want to support what I was doing. So, um, all right, so you've received a donation, now what? Now this is important because there's a lot that you can do to engage your donors and to keep them involved in everything that you're doing. 
um, just by um, how you handle things after you get a donation. So the first thing is send an immediate acknowledgement via email, um, making sure that you thank your donor and let them know that you're going to send another thank you after the event so that they um, know how the whole event experience went for you. But you never want someone to wonder whether, they got your, whether you got their donation or not. So always make sure that you immediately acknowledge someone's donation. As I've mentioned before, if you're on Facebook or Twitter, acknowledge your, your donor via social media. It's a great way to not only publicly thank them, um, but it also is a great way to pick up some potential donors who may not have supported you because they weren't on your radar. Um, and then update any tracking that you're doing of your fundraising performance. So obviously I showed a couple of charts here that I personally have kept track of. And this is really helpful for me in terms of when I do my participation the next year, figuring out how much money to ask someone for or um, to be able to, to figure out what I should set my fundraising goal at. Um, you can do this easily through your participant center. You can download your own fundraising report. It will um, download it into Excel, and you can do all sorts of various um, data analysis through figuring out how many asks it took, um, you know, what dates you got your most donations, what your um, average donation size was, and all, all those kinds of things. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the fundraising tools. I know we have just a few more minutes here before the end of the hour. We are going to save some time for Q&A. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the Participant Center, one of the tools that you have. Here's just a quick screenshot of that. Um, but there are a bunch of fundraising tools available to you within the Participant Center. Um, but we always recommend that you are personalizing your Participant Center, adding a photo, and adding in your own personal story of why you're doing this three days so that when people visit your personal page, um, they get more information about why this is important to you. There's uh, tools in here of how to actually create your Participant Center, how to set that up and personalize it. And again, there's a fundraising FAQ, and your coach is going to be one of your best resources for this. So if you have any questions about this, please feel free to reach out to your coach. Um, take a look at the Participant Center how-to, um, but again, make sure that you're personalizing that as much as possible. Um, and then the other tool which is new this year which helps with mobile fundraising is the three-day fundraising app. Um, that allows you to request donations. You can see the link down in the bottom there for sending reminders, and it gives you a really quick view of how you're doing with your fundraising through the app. So if you haven't downloaded that, um, definitely go ahead and do that. Um, and Liz, I don't know, do you have anything to add to the topic for the Participant Center or the fundraising app? Um, the Participant Center, just um, along the right-hand side where you're personalizing your Participant Center page, sending out your emails, yeah, over there on the far right-hand side. Perfect. I think the biggest thing I, I can stress is to personalize your page. Like you said, yeah. make it personal. Thank you. And anything with the fundraising app? I haven't used it a whole lot. Um, I sent I sent out my emails and my letters, um, but not much. It's pretty easy. It's very straightforward. Yeah, I think the feedback that we've gotten is that it's very user friendly. So, right. yeah. Um, and then again, I will absolutely tout these uh, seven amazing women and their amazing ability to support you in every way that you need it with your fundraising, your training, your overall performance um, in the three-day. So if there's anything that you need, every single person on the screen is more than qualified to help you and is invested in your success with the three-day. So please make sure that you're reaching out to your coach. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is it's so important as we go about fundraising to be really grounded in the reason why we're doing this. When you feel, when you feel a little stumbled by your fundraising or um, you just feel like you're not going to meet your goal, it's so important to stay connected. Um, and I remember you know, how meaningful my first three-day experience was doing this on behalf of my mom and being so grateful that 17 years later that she is a breast cancer survivor and participating in these events and giving back. So it's good to keep that reason of why you're doing this as you go about your fundraising. So um, Liz, I'm going to turn it over to see if there are any questions at this point. I know we got started a little late, um, but I will stay on as 
uh, as, as long as we can so that we can answer any questions. Have any come through? There are no questions yet. Anyone have okay. questions? Please ask. Okay, and mute, unmute everyone um, if I can. If you give me just a second. Um, let's see here. So everyone at this point is unmuted. So um, if there's noise in the background, if you want to just go ahead and put yourself back on mute. But does anybody have any questions that we can answer at this point? No questions? All right. Can you hear me? I have one. Yes. Yeah. Have you done anything besides send letters out? That's a good question. So me personally, that, that's a great point. I did nothing other than send personal letters out. Um, as I said, like fundraising event, um, I've never done like an auction or a, anything along those lines. I know some people, as I said at the beginning, you know, the, the options are really limitless. Um, mm -hmm. But I personally have only sent out fundraising letters. That's how I've done it. Okay. This is Liz. I, I have, again, like Molly, I myself have completed all of my fundraising through just my emails and my personal letters that I have mailed out, mm -hmm. but I have assisted some of my teammates with fundraisers. Um, I've hosted a car wash. We've had a silent auction at a restaurant, um, uh, helped at um, like a Panda Express or a Chili's type restaurant night. Um, helped another friend at a, it's called As You Wish, it's a clay painting party. So lot, there's lots of other ways to fundraise as well. But I will tell you from my personal experience and from my experience with my teammates, your best fundraising is going to come from your personal interactions with people in your emails and your letters. Right. I agree with that, but we, we have a larger team now and mm -hmm. Uh, some of some of the teammates need assistance in getting their money more than just email. So I was hoping that this uh, webinar would provide other ways that we could fundraise and make a sizable amount of money. So some of the ones that I have heard, and there are, um, have you been to the Fundraising Ideas Library on the three-day website? I, I looked at that uh to be honest, last year, I, I haven't done my homework this year. This is my 14th, 15th walk. Okay. Wow. And, and your name is? Bernice Willis. I, Bernice, I have a team, Betty Boone. And we started in San Francisco the first time it was done there. And okay. since then, we've had new teammates each year, but two of us have been steady the whole time. So we're trying to help our new team members uh, reach their goal. So I don't know how, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's been updated since last year. Bernice, I can also email you the, we have a new updated version of 101 fundraising ideas. Okay. It has really great ideas on it. Um, a new uh, one that um, I heard about a few years ago that happens to be a favorite of mine, mm -hmm. especially the team. Um, are most of you in the same area? Yes, fairly close. Perfect. Perfect. A great idea is a flamingo flocking. Um, where you actually go out and you purchase 15 or so, 20 more if you can, cheap plastic pink flamingos, and okay. you do this superstitiously at night, go out and you plant them in people's yard, um, and for a donation, they get removed. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, and I actually heard of a gentleman, a, um, a family in his team in a very small town in Louisiana who did this a few years ago, and in less than 20 days, they had raised over $21,000. Really? Place in flamingos in people's yards? No, it wasn't just people. They actually hit car dealerships and doctor's offices. I mean, because once you play, once they're placed, people pay to have them removed. They can also pay to have them placed someplace else. Um, mm. And then they can also pay to have flamingo insurance so that they don't get hit again. It becomes quite a challenge then, you know, where people are going, oh, go hit my doctor, go hit this person. So I'll send you that information. Okay, I, I would appreciate anything like that. And I'll look also at the 101 ideas for fundraising. Perfect. Um, yeah, 
One of my teammates think- is on the call right now reminding me we did a fundraiser last night and we made $574. Uh, uh, Sunnyville has a music festival weekly on Wednesdays and they allow nonprofits to work in the wine booth and the beer booth. Perfect. Sell that for them, and any tips that we make, we get to keep. So last night we made five hundred seventy-four dollars in tips. That's great. It was wonderful. So we're looking yeah, for things like that where we can, you know, get more than a hundred dollars because we share this amongst all the teammates. Yeah, and I think you know one of the other things that you can look at. Um, I once, when I was sending out fundraising requests, I had sent, um, I had, I had sent an email to a handful of people. This is one of the first first years that I was doing doing Cycle for Survival, and I asked people if they wanted to be part of my hundred dollar club, mm. and that I was reaching out to fifty donors to be part of my hundred dollar club. I had no clue what my hundred dollar club was. I literally just made it up to try to have a different way to talk to people. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's so many things that you can do. Fifty dollar Friday, right? Like, who wants to be part of fifty dollar Friday? And you know, you can just ask people to make a $50 donation on Friday, you know, like, so there are ways that you can do it. Um, I think we can also put you in touch with some of our other team captains of larger teams Mm -hmm. to um, connect with them to get some ideas. If you haven't been on the message board or on the Facebook page, you can also put a request out to participants that way because one of the greatest aspects of the three-day community is that you have you have this, the ability to tap into the resources, knowledge, and experience of not just ourselves on the coaching side, but so many of the participants as well who have been doing this. So um, I'd recommend that you go on the message boards to ask people what they've done for fundraisers. Um, and we can also make sure that, uh, that Liz, if you can make note of that, we can, we can put her in touch with some other team captains who may have some information to share. Perfect. I have a couple of ideas of people who have maybe done golf tournaments and a few things like that. Yeah, perfect. I appreciate that. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah no, yeah, no problem. Yeah. What other questions or any comments that people have? Okay. All right. Well, we are going to go ahead and wrap up then. Um, we really appreciate your time today. Um, and more than that, your participation in the three-day. Um, I think I mentioned this before. It's an event that is certainly near and dear to my heart and something I feel so grateful for being able to work on. I, if you have any questions for me specifically, p- please feel free to route those through to your coach, and they can get any questions over to me. Um, please make sure that you're sharing the information about the webinar with your teammates or some of your friends who you're doing the event with. And there will be another um, there will be another webinar on the 25th, so you can pass this along to other people. Um, I will also be out on the event um, at every event this year, so I hope some of you will take the opportunity to come up and say hello to me. I'm usually in the lounge area setting that up and helping with camp show and ceremonies and stuff like that. And again, my name is Molly. So um, thank you guys so much for your time, your attention, and your passion for this event. We look forward to seeing you on event and wish you all of the best luck and success with your fundraising. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.